need to have rebate to do the study. The field since 1978 and today has exploded. And I mean, you know this because you see and hear talk in everywhere. Um, popular media, blogs, everything. But in the scholarly world, it has exploded, not just in anthropology, sociology, history, literature, film. Uh, look, I was looking recently, there's three books published on food and film in the past five years. Uh, philosophy, I don't know about linguistics, don't ask me about it. But it's everywhere. And so, you know, I felt like I had jumped onto this bandwagon just as it was taking on. It was really good timing. So this is a um, dissertation in 1981. Uh, based on interviews and participant observation, I did not have a reporter with me when I did that research. Um, I was a little shy, believe it or not. This is, I don't appear as a shy person today, but I was shy then. And I didn't have my dissertation committee saying, you must have a reporter. So I did my interviews, but without a reporter, and did know. After I wrote my dissertation, I said, you know what? I don't have the kind of data I want, because I wanted to let the people speak for themselves. I didn't want to be the filter. I didn't want my voice to be the only voice. So the next study I did was in Florence, Italy. Um, and a lot of people say, you're paid to study food in Florence? What? <laughs> How can I get that job? Um, <laughs> but um, what I, what, by an accident of fate, I had a husband who was Florentine. I, I am no longer married to him. Uh, we parted ways. I have a wonderful husband now who is not Italian. I was married at the time. <laughs> I was married at the time to a Florentine, and which was my spent 13 years. And so I lived with him and his family. I spoke Italian with them all the time. We became fluent in Italian. And basically, when I realized through my Sardinia study, I didn't have the data I wanted. I came up with this methodology which I call food-centered life history. And these are essentially recorded interviews uh, with willing subjects about everything to do with food in their lives. Uh, anthropologists call these like focused life history. And Dr. Abarca here is used with a very similar methodology, which he calls Charla, Charla Pudinati, culinary chat. Well, I use food centered life history. And I did these with all of my ex husband's living relatives. So it's essentially a social unit, the extended family. And they were people I had known for a decade, over a decade. So they were very willing to talk. Um, and sort of develop this notion of the food voice or food as voice. In other words, food, like by asking people about food, you're providing something for them to talk about that is reasonably coherent but moves very smoothly. And what was interesting in Italy was that men talked about food as willingly and as excitedly as women did. Uh, whereas in many cultures, the men go, food, 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 what should you say? You eat it, it's good. Uh, but women, all in every culture that I've worked in, which isn't that many, so whatever. Uh, <laughs> but, but women that I've worked with, Found food to be a very easy topic. And what I found is a lot of women who are kind of, you know, consider themselves nobody important, as many women over time have done. Oh, uh, well, I'm just housewife. If you say, talk to me about politics, so go, I don't know about this. But if you say, talk to me about food, oh, yeah, okay, I'm an expert. <laughs> so it is a way of, you know, I don't like the word give voice to someone, they have a voice, but providing a, a channel for people to talk um, about their culture. Um, so I, I, I did this research in the early 80s, and finally I did a research in 2003, and then finally got the book out in 2004. 
bringing great cheer to many colleagues who said, you got your book out after 20 years? It's still hot for me. <laughs> so I will say, it wasn't the only thing I was, I was not doing in those years. Um, the, another project I did, which came out in this earlier book, this Anthropology of Food and Body came out in 99. And some of the things I looked at in that book were research I was doing essentially while my kids were little. It was really hard to travel. I was doing research in my home community which was Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, I did work with my college students. I did a study uh, through my own pregnancy. I got really interested in this issue of how pregnant women often say, oh, I'm fat, uh, because you have this big belly. I'm fat. No, you're not fat. You have a baby. How does thinking about being pregnant as being fat affect the woman's self-concept? And does it flip over if you could say, I'm fat and I'm proud because I'm pregnant, can you then continue on in life and say, I'm fat and I'm proud? <laughs> or is fat, does fat continue to be the source of shame? And when my kids were little, um, and I was like hanging around their daycare a lot, I thought, I'm going to do a study in a daycare. Now, this was before human subjects and IRBs and all that. And what I found was I, I naively went in and thought, I'm going to interview four-year-olds. <laughs> 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 so that's in where I say, oh, talk to me about your food. No, I don't want to. Um, so <laughs> what I found was, if, yeah, them, if I walked up to them and said, tell me a story, they would then spin out these amazing fantasy stories <laughs> that were full of food, images, and metaphors. And so I collected their stories, and then I analyzed them, sort of the boys' stories and the girls' stories, <laughs> and found some very interesting gender themes. Uh, one, I'll just mention, boys use food and eating very often as a form of aggression. You know, I'll eat you up. <laughs> like like Lori said that, I'll eat you up, I love you so. Eating as a gift, devouring. Whereas for gir little girls, even four-year-olds and five-year-olds, Eating was about social relations, uh, feeding others, uh, moms taking care of babies, making pancakes, and things like this. Um, yeah. Yeah. My husband said, talk to your son. Three days in a row, the daycare provider said that he's not eating his fruit. And they said, you know, fruit is good for you. Your peaches, your bananas. I said, don't you like apples? And he's like, mommy, I like white rice. <laughs> <laughs> This morning I cut off apple and I gave it to him and he threw it back at me while I was driving, right? And I was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. But you know, it's a challenge to get someone to eat fruit when you're not there. Yeah, you're trying to eat it. So it's a great thing. This is a food narrative. Yeah, and he used it as a form of aggression. <laughs> right. So I have a wonderful article you might want to see about uh, parents of taking eating children. Not saying yours is taking, but um, okay. So the the middle piece is this work I did in Antonio, Colorado, which is what I'm going to talk about tonight. So. I'm not going to talk about that now. And just mention very briefly the new research I'm doing back in Italy. Um, and this is research on food activism. And it started with interviews with members of the Slow Food Organization. Um, and I'm going to go back next semester to Cagliari, Italy, which is on Sardinia. So it's sort of back to where I started my dissertation research 30 odd years ago. And I'm going to look at food activism there. And what I'm interested in is so starting with the Slow Food Movement, which is this organization uh, that was founded in Italy in the town of Bra, actually, <laughs> led by uh, a charismatic leader named Carlo Pentrini that now has managed to get 100,000 members around the world, uh, which is not very many, but it's also very many in a way, um, because these are all dues-paying members, and the dues are about uh, $60 a year per person, so it's not cheap. 
But what they do is they organize local chapters of the slow food movement that are called Convolte in Italy or Convivium, Convivia, in the rest of the world. And Slow Foods USA decided that they were going to get rid of the term Convivium and call themselves chapters. So that's why there's three different words. And these are grassroots volunteer groups um, that organize local events and try to change the food system on a very local level. And so what I did in spring 2009 was go sort of use the snowball method, which is what anthropologists call uh, random luck on finding informants. And so you find one person and then the ball starts rolling, they tell you about somebody else, or you know somebody, or you go to a conference and find people. And I started doing interviews with these people, um, did 38 interviews with diverse chapter leaders and members to sort of get their conception of what their work with Slow Food meant. And Slow Food's mantra is good, clean, and fair food. That's what Slow Food promotes. Good, tasty, local, nutritious, healthy, non-polluted, non-processed, non-disgusting. Um, <laughs> Clean, again, environmentally and, and health, environmentally sustainable and healthy. And fair, meaning produced under fair conditions for the workers, so not exploiting migrant workers, for example, and at fair prices for consumers. And so my question is, are they succeeding? And what I found is, as I talked about this, as I, as I talked about that research, I get a lot of people saying, well, is slow food really changing the world? <laughs> so why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? And I'm like, no, wait a minute. I'm not an apologist for slow food. I'm just studying them. And what their comments led me to think about was, you can't really study the success of a food activist group by only looking at the group. You've got to look beyond the group at the bigger community. So what I'm going to do now is when I go back, is try to look at the whole alternative food system in the city of Calgary, which is a city of uh, about 300,000. What else is going on besides slow food? What networks are being um, sort of set up? And are they actually changing anything other than sort of the fringes? Um, like, so, you know, you have a city of 300,000 people. If only 200 are getting good, clean, and fair food, are you succeeding? Or are you starting a ripple effect? That's what I want to see. Is there a ripple effect? What are the networks? How broadly is this spreading? And sort of look at slow food as one piece of the puzzle, not the whole study that I'm doing. And I think um, for you guys, for young people, food activism is extremely interesting. And I have a lot of students sort of jumping onto this. Um, examples of food activism, FNB is Food Not Bombs, and that little slide there is the Food Not Bombs activists. They're freegans, they glean food and then cook it and then give it away. That's all they do. Um, and they put up a sign that says Food Not Bombs. <laughs> of course, have the message. Um, but that's sort of one way to do this. Um, you have vegetarianism. People trying to change the world by making a decision to eat vegetarian. Farmers markets, urban gardens, buying clubs, school gardens, uh, buy fresh, buy local. That's what BFBL is. We have a big buy fresh, buy local thing going on in Pennsylvania. Via uh, Campesina is an international organization of producers. Farmers, what we used to call peasants, you know, small farmers, working together to bring justice to the food system. Um, last thing, I just wanted to mention some of the research my students have done. Uh, you talked about your ethnographic methods class. Uh, I teach ethnographic methods at my university, and oh, uh, what, what the students do in my class is they start a project, um, come up with a project, do a research design, carry it out, and finish it. <coughs> and uh, these are some of the things that my students have done. Um, AFP is Autism Spectrum Disorder. Um, and I have a student who has uh, a son 
move on to the fondness spectrum. And 